Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a man telephoning a friend to find out about their local public library. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hello? Hi, Susie. It's Paul here. How are you? Enjoying your new job? You're working at the library, aren't you? Yes. I started when the library reopened a month ago. It's great. Actually, Carol and I have been meaning to join for a while. Oh, you should. It doesn't cost anything, and the new library has all sorts of facilities. It's not just a place where you borrow books. For instance, there's an area with comfortable seats where you can sit and read the magazines they have there. Some people spend the whole morning there. Mm. Wish I had that amount of time to spend. <laughs> yes, you must be pretty busy at present, with the children and everything. We are, yes. But we're hoping to get away this summer. We're thinking of going to Greece. Well, we've got a much larger section of the library devoted to travel books now, so you should come and have a look. I can't remember if there's anything specifically on Greece, but I should think so. OK. Now, Carol's organising a project for the history class she teaches at school. It's about life in the town a hundred years ago. Do you have anything that might be useful? Yes. Actually, we've now got a new section with materials on the history of the town and surrounding region. Right. I'll tell her. You can't always find that sort of thing on the internet. Now, in the old library, there used to be a separate room with reference books. It was a really nice, quiet room. Yes, we've put those books in the main part of the library now, but we do have a room called the community room. It can be hired out for meetings, but at other times, people can use it to study. I might use that. It's hard to find anywhere quiet at home sometimes. I can't remember how old your son and daughter are. We've introduced a special section of fiction written specially for teenagers but they might be a bit young for that. Yes, they would be. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Well, we do have lots of activities for younger children. Yes. For example, we have a science club. At the next meeting, they're going to be doing experiments with stuff that everyone has in the kitchen, sugar and flour and so on. They might be interested, yes. And we have a competition for children called Reading Challenge. That doesn't begin until after the end of term. They have to read six books and they get a certificate if they manage it. So that gives them something to do while they're on holiday, instead of getting bored. That's the idea. And there's special activities for adults too. On Friday, 
we have a local author called Tanya Streep who's going to be talking about her new novel. It's called Catch the Mouse and she based the story on a crime that actually took place here years ago. Right. We're not free on Friday, but I'll look out for the book. Now, this probably isn't for you, but we do have IT support available for members. We get quite a few older people coming along who are wanting to get up to speed with computer technology. It's on Tuesday mornings. They don't need to make an appointment or anything. They just turn up. Well, my mother might be interested. I'll let her know. OK. And there's another service which you wouldn't expect from a library, which is a free medical checkup. The hospital arranges for someone to come along and measure the level of sugar in your blood and they check cholesterol levels at the same time. Really? Yes, but that's only for the over 60s, so you wouldn't qualify. OK. Well, I'll tell my mother. She might be interested. What other information? Well, we do have a little shop with things like wall charts and greetings cards and also stamps, so you can post the cards straight away, which is really useful. Yeah. Well, I'll bring the children round at the weekend and we'll join. Oh, one more thing. I'll be bringing the car. Is there parking available? Yes, and it's free in the evening and at weekends. Perfect. Well, thanks, Susie. See you soon. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a recorded message by an employee of an investment society giving information about savings and investment options. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 13. Welcome to the information line of the State Investment Society. Why would you choose to put your money into an investment society and not a bank? Well, SIS offers everything you'd expect from a bank, but the difference is we're a cooperative. We're 100% owned by our customers, people like you, and that means we always put your best interests first. You won't see our profits going into large foreign-owned finance corporations. No, you'll see them coming back to you and your local community. As a cooperative, we work hard to keep our fees competitive and absolutely minimal. Even better, we can advise you about ways to avoid fees. Here are some suggestions. Firstly, we recommend you carry out as much of your personal banking as possible with us. We won't charge account fees unless your account becomes inactive for some reason. See? No unnecessary fees. Secondly, if you maintain certain minimum account balances, you won't have to pay any transaction charges for transferring money between any accounts that have the same customer number, although there may be some service charges that apply, such as the establishment of automatic payments. So, how can we help you?
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 14 to 20. Let's look first at savings options. We can give you three options. Our internet account earns you interest from your very first dollar deposited. You don't have to maintain a minimum balance and you earn a good interest rate from the start. Interest calculated daily and paid into your account monthly. You always have immediate access to your money by using the internet, text or telephone banking. What's more, there are no account or transaction fees. With our Stairs Saver scheme, the more you save, the higher interest you earn. Again, there's no minimum balance, but as your balance grows, you'll earn higher interest rates. There are three interest tiers, or steps, plus bonus interest. Interest is calculated daily and paid monthly. Now, what about access to your money? You are free to make as many withdrawals as you like, but if you restrict them to one a month, and your balance increases over that month, then you'll earn that bonus interest. With our simple saver scheme, access is available anytime, and we don't impose penalties for withdrawals. This scheme has one interest rate, no minimum balance, and interest is calculated daily and paid annually at the end of the financial year, the 30th of June. So, you can see that savings accounts are ideal if you're starting from scratch. Do you know you can open a savings account with as little as $10? They're usually the best choice for short-term financial goals. For the longer term, we recommend some kind of investment account. Let's take a look at our investment options. Starting with the safest, the most secure, low-risk option is a basic term deposit, starting with a minimum deposit of $1,000. Interest is calculated daily, but you can choose whether to have it paid out monthly, quarterly, or at maturity. What we recommend if you really want to see money grow is having interest compounded quarterly. You'll only get access to your funds when your term deposit matures, so be sure to think carefully about the amount of time before you lock it away. It could be anything from six months to five years. Bonds are generally a longer commitment, but they may bring better rewards in the future. There is a minimum deposit of $5,000 and interest is calculated daily. You may choose to have interest compounded quarterly or paid out quarterly. And, of course, you'll have access to your money when your bond reaches maturity. Looking really long term, there is our retirement fund, which is, of course, a savings plan for retirement. There is no minimum deposit, but the good news is that you can choose to contribute a certain percentage of your income before tax is paid on it. As for interest... Well, you choose a particular type of fund which has a different level of return depending on the level of risk. And access? Well, not before you turn 60 years old. As I said, it's a retirement scheme. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two anthropology students, called Victor and Olivia, discussing their joint presentation about a Norwegian explorer called Tor Heyerdahl. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Right, well, for our presentation, 
Shall I start with the early life of Tor Heyerdahl? Sure. Why don't you begin with describing the type of boy he was, especially his passion for collecting things? That's right. Had his own little museum. And I think it's unusual for children to develop their own values and not join in their parents' hobbies. I'm thinking of how Heyerdahl wouldn't go hunting with his dad, for example. Yeah, he preferred to learn about nature by listening to his mother read to him. And quite early on, he knew he wanted to become an explorer when he grew up. That came from his camping trips he went on in Norway, I think. No, it was climbing that he spent his time on as a young man. Oh, right. After university, he married a classmate, and together they decided to experience living on a small island to find out how harsh weather conditions shaped people's lifestyles. As part of their preparation, before they left home, they learnt basic survival skills, like building a shelter. I guess they needed that knowledge in order to live wild in a remote location with few inhabitants, cut off by the sea, which is what they were aiming to do. An important part of your talk should be the radical theory Heyerdahl formed from examining mysterious ancient carvings that he happened to find on the island. I think you should finish with that. OK. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. All right, Victor, so after your part, I'll talk about Tor Heyerdahl's adult life, continuing from the theory he had about Polynesian migration. Up until that time, of course, academics had believed that humans first migrated to the islands in Polynesia from Asia in the West. Yes, they thought that travel from the East was impossible because of the huge empty stretch of ocean that lies between the islands and the nearest inhabited land. Yes, but Heyerdahl spent ages studying the cloud movements, ocean currents and wind patterns to find if it was actually possible. And another argument was that there was no tradition of large shipbuilding in the communities lying to the east of Polynesia. But Heyerdahl knew they made lots of coastal voyages in locally built canoes. Yes, or sailing on rafts, as was shown by the long voyage that Heyerdahl did next. It was an incredibly risky journey to undertake. Sometimes I wonder if he did that trip for private reasons, you know? To show others that he could have spectacular adventures. What do you think, Olivia? Well, I think it was more a matter of simply trying out his idea, to see if migration from the East was possible. Yes, that's probably it. And the poor guy suffered a bit at that time because the war forced him to stop his work for some years. Yes... When he got started again and planned his epic voyage, do you think it was important to him that he achieve it before anyone else did? Um, I haven't read anywhere that that was his motivation. The most important factor seems to have been that he used only ancient techniques and local materials to build his raft. Yes. I wonder how fast it went. Well, it took them 97 days from South America to the Pacific Islands. Mm. And after that, Heidel went to Easter Island, didn't he? We should mention the purpose of that trip. I think he sailed there in a boat made out of reeds. Oh, that was later on in Egypt, Olivia. Oh, yes, that's right. But what he wanted to do was talk to the local people about their old stone carvings and then make one himself to learn more about the process. I see. Well, what a great life. Even though many of his theories have been disproven, he certainly left a lasting impression on many disciplines, didn't he? To my mind, he was the first person to establish what modern academics call practical archaeology. I mean, that they try to recreate something from the past today, like he did with his raft trip. It's unfortunate that his ideas about where Polynesians originated from have been completely discredited. Yes. Right, well, I'll prepare a PowerPoint slide at the end that acknowledges our sources. I mainly used The Life and Work of Tor Heyerdahl by William Oliver, I thought the research methods he used were very sound, although I must say I found the overall tone somewhat old-fashioned. I think they need to do a new revised edition. Yeah, I agree. What about the subject matter? 
I found it really challenging. Well, it's a complex issue. I thought the book had lots of good points. What did you think of the illustration? That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4. You will hear a lecture on volcanic activity and its effect on the atmosphere. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. In these environmental science lectures, I guess you're all used to hearing about global warming. Well, I'm here today to talk to you about one particular volcano and its effect of global cooling. I'll begin by going back a little bit in time. Towards the middle of 1991, the second largest volcanic eruption of the last century occurred in the Philippines not far from the capital city, Manila, on the island of Luzon. Mount Pinatubo belongs to a chain of volcanoes in the area, and this was by no means its first eruption. There is evidence of eruptions from approximately 500, 3,000, and 5,500 years ago. The events of the 1991 Mount Pinatubo eruption began in July 1990, when a magnitude 7.8 earthquake occurred 100 kilometers northeast of the Pinatubo region. The sleeping giant was reawakened, but few people had any idea of what was in store for them. In mid-March 1991, many earthquakes were experienced around Mount Pinatubo, and this is when volcano scientists, or volcanologists as they are called, started their investigation of the mountain. Before the disaster, thousands of people lived in very close proximity to the mountain, and on April 2nd, small explosions from vents near the crater dusted their villages with ash. This resulted in the order for evacuations of 5,000 people later that month. Earthquakes and explosions continued to harass the residents, and on June 5th, a Level 3 alert was issued for two weeks because of the possibility of a major eruption. However, the appearance of a large amount of lava protruding from the mountain on July 7th led to the announcement of a Level 5 alert on June 9th, indicating an eruption in progress. An evacuation area within 20 kilometers of the volcano was established and this time 25,000 people were evacuated. On the following day, Clark Air Base was evacuated and the danger radius was extended to 30 kilometers from the volcano, resulting in the total evacuation of 58,000 people. On June 15th, just after midday, the eruption of Mount Pinatubo commenced and lasted nine hours, causing numerous major earthquakes due to the collapse of the land at the top of the mountain and the creation of a huge caldera. What's a caldera, I hear you say? Well, it's obvious, really. With a huge eruption such as this, where enormous amounts of material have exploded into the air, the summit falls into what is now an empty chamber and thus forms a large crater. As luck would have it, as the eruption was taking place, a tropical storm was passing just to the northeast of Mount Pinatubo, bringing a lot of rainfall to the area. The dust and cinders that had been thrown up into the atmosphere combined with the water vapor from the storm to cause a rainfall of tephra that fell across the whole island of Luzon. Most of the people who perished during the eruption did so because of the weight of the ash collapsing roofs and killing the occupants of the houses. If it hadn't been for that passing storm, the death toll would certainly have been much lower. But that's not all. Besides the ash, Mount Pinatubo expelled between 15 and 30 million tons of sulfur dioxide gas. Can you guess what happened next? Yes, the sulfur dioxide mixed with water and oxygen in the atmosphere to become sulfuric acid, which is a major contributor to ozone reduction. The eruption plume from Mount Pinatubo reached high into the atmosphere, 
attaining an altitude of 34 kilometers, and the resulting aerosol cloud spread around the Earth in two weeks and had covered the planet within a year. During the years 1992 and 1993, the ozone hole situated over Antarctica reached an unprecedented size. The cooling effects of this cloud over the Earth were remarkable. It reduced global temperatures considerably. In the United States, for example, we experienced our third coldest and third wettest summer in 77 years during 1992. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Unleash your inner reading master for IELTS, a comprehensive guide. Conquering the IELTS reading section requires a multi-pronged approach. Here's a roadmap to success. 1. Demystify the test. Familiarize yourself with the format and question types. Understand the three reading passages, each with a distinct text style, descriptive, factual, or argumentative, and accompanying multiple choice, matching, or short answer questions. 2. Expand your vocabulary arsenal. Actively learn new vocabulary relevant to IELTS themes, like the environment, technology, or education. Explore diverse reading materials like newspapers, academic journals, and non-fiction books to naturally encounter and retain new words. 3. Develop speed reading prowess. Master the art of chunking reading groups of words. 3-5, at a time instead of individual letters. This technique increases reading speed without sacrificing comprehension. Practice regularly to build your chunking muscle. 4. Conquer time. Simulate exam conditions by practicing with timed reading tests. This not only sharpens your reading skills but also helps you develop a time management strategy for the actual test. 5. Embrace practice tests. Regularly take full-length practice tests under timed conditions. Analyze your mistakes and identify areas for improvement. This targeted approach accelerates your progress towards your desired score. Bonus tip, don't get bogged down by unfamiliar words. Focus on grasping the overall meaning of the passage and identifying key phrases that answer the questions. Utilize contextual clues to deduce the meaning of unfamiliar vocabulary. Remember, consistent